Good afternoon, everyone. Thank oh, yeah. you so pardon. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the program this afternoon. The history of the Mission Inn in Riverside, California, presented by Steve Leck. He is the director of docent training at the Mission Inn Foundation. He's also president of the Riverside Historical Society. And he's going to be talking to us, obviously, about the famous Mission Inn. So that's something that when you talk to people, I'm going to Riverside, or I've been to Riverside, California, and people all over the United States will say, oh, I know about that beautiful Mission Inn. And you've probably all seen the lights at the holiday times. Maybe you've been out there to have a visit. Maybe someone in your family has been there. Um, for a holiday or an anniversary or a wedding or a birthday or something special. So it's indeed a very special place. And we are just delighted to welcome Steve Leck. He is an author in addition to all of this special training about um, docenting at the Mission Inn Foundation. So welcome, Steve. Thank you very much for coming. But before Steve starts his program, could you all please mute yourself? Um, today's program is going to be recorded and it'll be put on YouTube Pasadena Library that you can share it with your friends. I have enabled live transcript if you would like to set that up on your computer. Also, Steve will take questions if you could please put them in chat and following the program, Steve will answer the questions. So, um, just welcome and thank you all very much for attending. Welcome, Steve. Okay, thank you. All righty, well, when, uh, when uh, Christine asked me to come and do this, uh, I had the massive task of, of talking about the entire history of the Mission Inn in um, just a you know, little bit of time. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and go for it and I hope to be able to cover just about everything. So. Anyways, um, <clears throat> yeah, welcome. Um, our story really begins with uh, this gentleman here, Christopher Columbus Miller. And Mr. Miller was uh, an uh, engineer and surveyor in Wisconsin doing his work, of course. And um, his wife was coming down with lung issues. And of course, at that time, really the only thing the doctor could do was tell you to move to a, an arid climate. And so Mr. Miller went ahead and moved to uh, LA where he was looking for a job so that he could earn some money and send for his wife and their four children. Now he went ahead and he uh, got a job doing some surveying at the Temescal tin mine site. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Riverside area, but that's generally where about Lake Matthews is today, sort of Southwest of town. <coughs> Well, he liked the area, and so he brought, uh, here are the mines themselves, and so he liked the area, and he uh, decided that they would settle there. So he sent for his wife, Mary, and their four children. We unfortunately don't have any picture of the youngest one, but here is um, Frank, Emma, and Alice Miller there, and this is uh, about 1874. They come out uh, on a very circuitous route. They go from Wisconsin to Chicago, from Chicago to San Francisco on the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Then they take a steamer down to LA. From LA, they take the railroad to a place called Spadra, which if you know where Cal Poly Pomona is, that's basically where Spadra was. And that's where the railroad service ended. So they hopped a stage and came out to Riverside at that point. And in the meantime, Mr. Miller had purchased the bit of land here that you see within, um, get my laser pointer here, right here in the original mile square of Riverside. Now Riverside itself by this time took up a lot more land than uh, just the mile square, but this was, <coughs> this was the downtown portion of it. And as you can see, this is the center of town right here. So they are just one block off of it. 
And this is 7th Street, which is now Mission Inn Avenue, and Main Street, which is now mostly the mall, Main Street Mall. So there, they opted to build a small two-story Adobe home here. And they called that the Glenwood. Now, we don't know why, but that name keeps popping up. And why did they build it like this? Well, basically, they were looking to have something to do. And Riverside was very much an outpost at this time. Um, it took you, you know, at least a day, if not two, to get here from L.A., um, three to four days down to San Diego, and probably several weeks out through the desert route. So if you're coming to Riverside, you're going to stay here for a little while. And so the Millers opted to start a small boarding house type of hotel. And so that's why they had 12-room hotel uh, uh, building, even though there was just the six of them. So almost immediately, then they started the Glenwood uh, Hotel. And it was alternately known as the Glenwood Cottages and the Glenwood Inn and the like. But it was a, a very kind of nondescript little hotel here for people coming out to Riverside who are going to stay for a, a little while, of course. Well, this became a pretty good going concern for them. Um, and so they made some additions to it. Um, this shot here is the original home, which you see over here. And then here is a addition to it. So if you've been to the Mission Inn lately uh, and you've been to the museum, this is pretty much a shot from, from Main and 7th looking into the lot here. So they had that, had the old Miller home. Uh, they've got a number of things here going on. And in 1880, all of this land and the buildings are sold to Frank Miller. Now, Frank Miller is the oldest of the sons. He's the second child, but the oldest son. Yeah, he's 23 at the time. And he opts to buy all of this land uh, from his dad. Now, his dad paid about $250 for the block. Then Frank Miller bought all the improvements along with it for about $5,000. But he was always looking for some business prospect to to engage in he'd had orange groves he'd had a grocery store he would had all kinds of things but in 1880 he opted to buy the family business the hotel from his dad and so he began running it um, really as the uh, and this is new research that we've had here in the last few years really as sort of the the mastermind of it but it's his sister Alice who's the number three child, who's really the day-to-day -day, um, manager of the hotel. So this is really kind of a brother and sister uh, affair. Frank Miller is the brains and the uh, business end of it. Alice is the hospitality end of it. And over the years, they're both known for their sort of individual specialties. Frank Miller for having vision for this place. And, and Alice for having the hospitality end of it. And she, uh, she was rather well known for that and for running a few other hotels too throughout her life. So anyways, the two of them now uh, embark on this uh, along with their youngest uh, brother, Ed. And Ed Miller, uh, he's kind of the jack of all trades. He's the maintenance man. He's the guy who runs the horse and buggy to the railroad station. Later on, he runs the automobile fleet, um, taking people on tours, going to the train stations, what have you. So it's really the three of, uh, of them who uh, stick around and run the hotel here. In 1882, uh, another wing is added to it here, as you can see. This is Main Street in Riverside. That other wing that I described to you is this one here. So this is another addition to it because business is kind of booming, if you will. And so he's uh, adding on. And again, as you can see, this is a pretty nondescript um, hotel. You could pretty much find this hotel just about anywhere. And that's be going to become important here as time goes on in there. Look at a few uh, shots of it uh, here. This is uh, looking from 7th Street. So if you're coming along 7th Street, this is be the view. 
Notice the porch so you can sit out here and enjoy the climate. That was really kind of the, the point to it. <clears throat> Here's the parlor. You'd go in and conduct business, sit around, chat, uh, read, what have you. Here's the dining room. Because of course, any good hotel uh, has to have its own dining room because this is not an overnight hotel. This is someplace where you're gonna spend several days, maybe even weeks, maybe even months. And so you'd have uh, its own separate dining room where you take your meals. And then this is a shot here along Main Street, looking at that last wing that I just showed you along here. Yeah. So the Glenwood Hotel here is growing. And so is Riverside. Uh, Riverside is the seat of the naval orange industry. And so there's a lot of people coming out here to see all of this. Uh, they want to see the parent naval orange trees. They want to see where it all started. They want to look to invest. Um, they want to see the potentials uh, for it. <clears throat> and many of these people are very wealthy, of course. We're in the era, the Industrial Revolution, in the aftermath of the Civil War. So we have a new uh, or nouveau riche clientele here that are coming out to Southern California in general, but also to Riverside. The problem is that we do not have a nice hotel for them to stay in then. And so while people might come out here to look, they would go to wherever else to stay. Uh, they'd go to Pasadena, LA, the beach, San Diego, um, any other place, because they demanded a certain uh, level of comfort and sophistication in their quarters then. Riverside is growing by leaps and bounds also, and it's becoming a very wealthy town at this time because of this naval orange industry here. This is Riverside in 1875. And you can look at it here. You see mostly, well, mostly open area, a few small wooden buildings, maybe one or two brick buildings, but nothing here to really tell you that this is a uh, town with a, a huge amount of pro, uh, prospect. Just 20 years later, we have the highest per capita income in the country because of that naval orange industry here. And all of a sudden now we have huge substantial brick buildings. These two are banks here. Uh, this is 8th, which is now University at Maine, if you know downtown Riverside. And so we're getting a lot of wealth in here <clears throat> uh, both from the standpoint of investment, but also visitors, uh, tourists, and the like. And so uh, well, here's another shot looking down Main uh, Street here to give you more of an idea. These are all substantial buildings, and they indicate that the town or the city at this point is going to be here for a while. Investing in it is a good investment as opposed to one with just a sprinkling of wooden buildings that might uh, might dry up and blow away in the very near future. So it's at this point then that Frank Miller thinks, well, what we need is a grand hotel here in town and I'm gonna build it. So in 1894, 95, he conceives of the idea of putting up, as you can see here, the new Glenwood. And it's a U-shaped building. Um, very much in an architectural style that would resemble something that you'd find in wherever, back east, Chicago, New York, Boston. Uh, one sort of exception to this, uh, which was done at hotels in Southern California primarily, of course, is to have the courtyard here in the middle and ensure that all of your rooms are outside rooms, meaning that they can be open to the, the fresh air because so many people are coming out here for the climate that you don't want to hold them up in an inside room with no windows. So many of our hotels at this time here in Southern California have some sort of a U-shaped building or at least a courtyard in the middle here. The problem for Frank Miller is that he's got a lot of good ideas, but he doesn't have a lot of cash. And it takes him uh, nearly 10 years to get the proper funding to start in on this. 
In the meantime, he connects with uh, these two gentlemen. The man on the left here is Arthur Benton. Arthur Benton is an architect in LA and he is a tremendous champion for the unique style that is Southern California. He says, rightfully so, that people are coming out here to see the romanticized missions, the early Spanish past, thanks to, of course, the climate and Ramona. And so instead of showing them just the missions, why don't we give them missions to come to? We should be building in what we now refer to as the mission revival style of architecture then. And so he has a tremendous influence on Frank Miller uh, then. And from a business standpoint, Frank Miller sees this uh, mission style as the way to go. Um, Benton basically says, you know, if we look down our, our main streets and, you know, the couple pictures I showed you there uh, beforehand are indicative of it. What is there to show somebody that they're not in Chicago, Boston, New York, what have you? So we have a unique place here. We need our own unique architecture. So Benton um, convinces Miller to build it that way. On the other side of our picture here, of course, is Henry Huntington. Now, Henry Huntington is the head of the Pacific Electric Railway, and he invests heavily in sites along the way to entice people, of course, to buy tickets on his railway. He and Miller are very close acquaintances. And so Henry Huntington sort of comes to the rescue by pitching in the lion's share of funding that Miller needs to build the new hotel. Um, the new hotel is gonna run about $250,000. Henry Huntington puts up about 150 of that. And then Miller uh, puts up uh, a lot too, his family does, and he also has a stock cooperative in town too to raise the rest. But suffice it to say that Miller's in hock up to his eyeballs. But he likes to have the quote, dramatize what you do. And that is what he wants to do. He doesn't want a simple hotel like he's had. So Benton draws up the plans in 1902. They begin construction. And here in February of 1903, they open as the Glenwood Mission Inn. And they simply stuck the mission moniker into the old hotel name because they already had some you know, loyalty to their, to their cause there. So they didn't want to give up that Glenwood name. Initially, it's known as the New Glenwood Hotel. Then it becomes the Glenwood Mission Inn. Then it becomes simply the Mission Inn uh, here. But you can see all the people here for it. Um, this is the old Miller home. He's taken off the top floor of it and he's made it into a tea room, art gallery, sort of a multi-purpose room uh, here. But now he has built, in effect, a mission uh, here. And uh, when we give tours of the hotel, one of the first things we say is that this was not one of the original missions. And usually we get a gasp or two from people who have always thought that it was one of the missions because it looks very much like it. But it's always a hotel, but it was built to look like a mission. And um, as we always say, if you wanted to believe it was a mission, Miller certainly wasn't going to argue with you, as long as your check kept clearing there. So here we have the, uh, the new Glenwood, uh, one of the first early postcards of it. We've got a tally ho getting ready to take off here. We have, of course, a campanile or bell tower here in the uh, courtyard with the bells in it. Bells are very important to the Miller family. They had about 850 in their collection at one time. They have chimes up in this tower that ring out. And most of the rest of this is, of course, rooms. It's still the U-shaped building, but now it's in a mission revival style. Here. And this is uh, actually probably right after the initial opening uh, of it there. So you get a kind of a, a glimpse here looking out in this way of just how unique it was, especially uh, if you have any ideas, if you have any uh, reminiscences of some of the older and other grand hotels here in, in Southern California. Think of the Huntington uh, there in um, Pasadena. Think of the Del Coronado in San Diego. 
um, those are very Eastern in influence. This is very Southern Californian in there. This is a diagram of how the inn was constructed uh, here because it was built in four different wings and I'll go through them each here. But this is that initial wing right here that you see from 7th Street or Mission and Avenue as you come in. Nowadays, this is the valet uh, area and the main entrance is here. And then, so this is done in 19, <coughs> excuse me, 193 um, there. And I'll show this throughout the, the talk here as we go through some of the other portions of the hotel. The, um, the old Miller home, like I said, becomes a tea room, uh, an art gallery. Here it is. We've got a large bell out here, plenty of seats, et cetera, um, because of course you're coming out here to enjoy the climate. So a lot of places for you to go. This is the interior of the, what was then called the old Adobe. That's the old Miller home. Um, if you belong to a club here in town, you may have had a meeting here. Um, you could just sit and rest and relax if you wanted to, if you were staying here. Our, our local chapter of our DAR started in this room uh, right here. And so it was very, very much, you know, for the guests and also for the locals. Then another one of uh, Miller's mottos was that you cannot be both grand and comfortable. And he really fell into the whole arts and crafts movement of getting back to uh, natural materials, getting back to craftsmanship and getting back to, to a more laid back style of, uh, of existence. He shunned stuff like this. This is a shot in the Hotel Bellevue. Look at how very formal this is. Um, if you were alive back then, you would not be caught dead in this lobby without all the proper accoutrements on. You'd be dressed to the, the hilt. That was not necessarily Miller's way. And so when you look at the lobby of the Mission Inn, it's very, yes, it's very dark, but it's also very comfortable. It's very cozy. It has lots of wood in it. We have all kinds of various chairs. He actually went back to the uh, Roycroft School in New York to buy furniture here. Um, it's meant to be more of the tavern type of, of look. Again, you cannot be both grand and comfortable. That actually came from a story regarding shoes uh, of all things, but he liked the quote. And so that was, um, that was one of his quotes. And it for many years hung over the, uh, the uh, front desk of the hotel. Um, it had, uh, the original wing had one large suite uh, in it. This was the grand suite of the hotel at the time. Uh, this was dubbed the presidential suite. Um, had a sitting room in here, two bedrooms up above here, one up the staircase uh, here. And so we had one large suite that could be rented and another large suite for the family because of course the family lived here uh, too. So Frank Miller, his wife and their daughter uh, lived here at the time. By 19... 8, 1909, he is now planning uh, the second wing of the hotel back here. This is called the Cloister Wing, open in July of 1911 here. And it's in addition to the back portion that goes all the way back here to 6th Street in there. And this is what it looks like here. <clears throat> uh, this is orange at 6th in downtown Riverside in there. Um, now he's using a brand new form of construction called a reinfor poured reinforced concrete, where you make a skeleton structure out of rebar, put a form around it, and then pour concrete over it to, um, to uh, construct it there. Um, the first wing is done in that sort of romanticized view of what the mission architecture looked like there. Um, lots of elements taken from it. In this instance, it's actually copying many of the missions in this wing here. If we look at our facade here on Orange Street, I call your attention to these buttresses here. 
with the little alcoves and then have you look at the facade here of the San Gabriel mission. And these buttresses are taken directly from that. If we turn the corner over onto 6th Street, we see this facade here. And then we look at the Carmel Mission Chapel facade and we see much the same uh, elements from it. Granted, it's elongated there, but we even have what's known as the Carmel Dome up here because this portion is taken from that Carmel Mission. We have the Carmel Room and this is known as the Carmel Tower um, there. And so he's actually, Arthur Benton does this wing too. He actually takes elements of the missions and puts them into the uh, architecture there. And so it's kind of a fascinating view of what they thought was important, at least at the time and then. So there's the chapel facade. The mainstay of this, besides three floors of uh, private rooms, is the cloister music room there. And this is the large room that he used for entertainment purposes. Again, people are coming here for several weeks and several months. Um, the hotel owner had to have something for them to do. And so he <clears throat> liked to gather his guests together. He would have Sunday service sing-alongs. He would have concerts, little skits, plays. Um, there's a Christmas pageant, all kinds of things in uh, this room. It has a massive theater organ over here, which is still there. It was restored about 15 or so years ago. And then as you can see here, just kind of a hodgepodge of chairs, settees, uh, what have you. And then there's a stage back here where performers could perform um, and the like. But this is a very large room. Nowadays, it's used mainly for you know, things like banquets and wedding receptions and the like. <clears throat> but at the time, this was used for gathering his uh, people together then. It also has probably one of the most famous of the areas of the hotel called the catacombs. Well, nowadays, it's called the catacombs. It's called the cloister walk at the time, which was a series of tunnels sort of underneath that cloister wing to um, um, put in you know, artifacts, paintings, what have you. You could take a walk through here on the three days out of the year that it rains, etc. Just a few years later, 1914, comes the Spanish wing, which is this portion here. And this is it. This is now done in the Spanish colonial style. I like to say that Miller actually tries to regress in architecture as he progresses in building um, there. Um, the architect on this wing was none other than Myron Hunt, who I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, there in Pasadena. Uh, he did a number of buildings throughout uh, Southern California. He's probably the most famous of the architects to work here uh, at the Mission Inn, but he does it in the Spanish colonial style. He designs this massive Spanish art gallery there which opened with a series of old Spanish masters, paintings, et cetera, and uh, still is an art gallery today, although it's used for, again, banquets and meetings and what have you there. It also has this, uh, created the Spanish patio, which is the outdoor eating area down below here. This is the cloister wing here we just discussed. Here's the Spanish wing where the photographer is standing and then down here too then and then here's another shot of it with the spanish patio eating or dining area down here the clock there and then the later additions on top here so this is all coming together now over a series of a few years but while he's doing this he needs to be able to house his help now he has older buildings in the back uh to house the help but eventually he's running out of room in the lot. So across the street, this is 6th Street here, he builds this building here, which becomes known as the Mission Inn Annex. And this is where his um, staff is housed. Riverside did not have a large enough pool of labor. Most people were either running businesses or uh, orange orchards. So he had to import his staff. So if you were a... Uh, maid, a cook, a waiter, 
bellhop, what have you, you probably lived in this building and this is the back portion of it here before or uh, during that time. This was the women's dorm right up against 6th Street. This is the men's dorm added later. And finally, then in 1931, he adds on the second biggest wing here, the Rotunda Wing, which finishes off the entire block because this is now 6th at Main. So with the construction of this now, the entire block is taken up by the hotel. And this was started in 1927, finished in 1931. This is what it looks like here. This again here is Main at 6th then. And this is the Rotunda Wing. It's mostly public uses. It's mostly businesses along here, a solarium up top, um, a number of larger rooms to use. There's only about a dozen private rooms in this wing here. But uh, by this time, he's opening this up to a lot more public space then. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. 1931, of course, we're back in the dab in the middle of the Depression. This is one of the largest construction projects in going in Riverside County. And this is a shot showing the construction crews. They're just about done, as you can see. The windows need to be put in and the like, but um, they're largely done uh, with it. And so this is sort of a congratulatory picture there. The Rotunda Wing has one of the, probably the best known of the areas of the hotel. And that is the, first of all, the St. Francis Atrio, which is this courtyard out here, followed by the St. Francis uh, Chapel. This is the wedding chapel of the hotel. And this is it here. It is built around two sets of artifacts there. This large gold uh, Rarados, uh, which is the proper term for it, uh, which was uh, built in 1776 in Guanajuato, Mexico. Uh, and then imported here to Riverside in about 1920. Miller, one of Miller's friends found that for sale and she negotiated with them and was able to get this put uh, on a train in about 32 boxes, came, showed up and um, Miller had to put it in that Spanish art gallery for a while until this room could be built specifically for it. So it have its own niche uh, here. And kind of the same uh, story exists for the Tiffany windows that are throughout the room here. These are all designed by Louis Tiffany for the Madison Square Presbyterian Church in New York. Um, unfortunately, that church only lasted for about 15 years in that iteration. And when it was being torn down in about 1920, Louis Tiffany was part of the committee to disperse the artifacts. And he knew Mr. Miller. And somehow they came to an agreement, we don't know what, but Miller received six windows that looked somewhat like this and two rosettes from, basically it was a series of eight or two rosettes and six of these uh, here. And uh, these all have months and flowers and fruit of the year around here and then scenes from the Bible in the middle. And there, we don't know what he paid for them, but, um, uh, obviously, some sort of agreement had to be made, so uh, this was put in along with that uh, Rivera dose there. Well, just four years later, now Frank Miller dies, uh, and that era comes to a close uh, when the visionary for this entire thing uh, dies in 1935, and just three years later, his sister Alice uh, died. So during that time then, ownership of the hotel goes to um, Frank Miller's one and only daughter, um, Alice Hutchings, and her husband, DeWitt. DeWitt had come here to work in the 20s. They met, or excuse me, in the uh, 1900s. They met, fell in love, and he kind of stayed on. So they take it on, and um, they run the hotel pretty much as dad had for a little while here throughout the 30s, but they do add some more meeting rooms slash bars. Uh, Miller was very, Frank Miller was very much the teetotaler and would not allow bars in the hotel. They thought from a business standpoint, having some place where people could come and meet was a good idea. So we start the El Mundo cocktail room in 1938. 
and by far the most famous of them, the Lea Lea Supper Club in uh, 1939 there. So these become hubs for the locals, plus also people staying here at the hotel. But of course, what comes next? Well, the Mission Inn enters the World War II phase and it sees a huge surge in business as we have loads of military, uh, militarily oriented uses in Riverside. We have Camp Anza, the main debarkation point for troops going to the Pacific Theater. We have March Field, uh, the flying uh, trainings portion of it. We have uh, Camp Han across from it, anti-aircraft training, POWs and the like. And so the inn becomes sort of an adjunct officers club. We have lots of um, USO rallies, bond drives and the like. This is Dale Evans, Eddie Cantor, and Mary Astor coming out for a bond drive uh, at the time. And so the inn is just bustling uh, with business throughout the, the war years. That, of course, uh, takes a nosedive, though, after the war. And things are really starting to change from a societal standpoint um, at this time. Now, Alice and DeWitt do decide that maybe the hotel needs to be modernized. So they remove the old Adobe in 1948 and put in the swimming pool, which you can um, go to nowadays and see, of course. Um, they do a few other things uh, to it too, but business is, is really heading down downhill. But they're getting on in years. And as you can see here, they die in the early 50s, just about four months apart. Um, then. And so with their death, the ownership of the hotel goes to their three children here, Isabella, Frank, and, and DeWitt, uh, and Helen, excuse me. But unfortunately, uh, well, I guess it's your perspective. The grandchildren, the Miller grandchildren want nothing to do with the hotel. They are interested in other things, They've grown up here, and so they really don't have an interest in it um, and the like. Plus, what they're inheriting is a vastly different hotel than what uh, mom and dad had, had done and grandma and grandpa uh, had, too. Because, of course, now in the 50s, we're in a totally different situation. Uh, Riverside, just like pretty much every place else, is suburbanizing business homes, people are moving out of the centralized downtown and into the suburbs uh, then. And Riverside is no longer a way station. Well, it becomes a way station. It's no longer a destination. We always relied on the LA crowd coming out here to Riverside to kind of bolster some of the business because in the pre-war era, um, Riverside was pretty much about a day's trip from LA. And so you take off from LA, come to Riverside, stay there. With better cars and better freeways, now it becomes Palm Springs. And of course, when do you see Palm Springs A day? Well, really the post-war 50s, early 60s uh, time. So Riverside gets bypassed uh, at this point. Um, so Palm Springs sees its growth. And what we see now is an old hotel kind of stuck in the past. So they opt to sell it out of the family. Uh, there in 1956 to um, the outfit that owns San Francisco's Fairmont Hotel. And that is run by Ben Swig here. And ben Swig um, is known for having bought the Fairmont Hotel, renovated it, modernized it and the like, and um, brought it up to snuff. And so a lot of people here in Riverside are thinking this is, is a good thing. Uh, to do. Maybe he'll modernize our hotel. Well, that's exactly what he did um, there. He pretty much got rid of all the dark wood and the like. He painted everything in pastel colors, very much used a 1950s mindset of making everything modern uh, then, sort of out with the old and in with the new. So there's the dining room. Here's that presidential lounge now. He converts that presidential suite into a presidential lounge, and you can still go there now, that's, that's still open, uh, too. 
and redoes all of the rooms in a similar fashion there. Um, unfortunately, uh, Riverside is not San Francisco. And um, while San Francisco continued to have a tourist draw, Riverside did not. Uh, that we're pulling out orange groves that people came to see for new houses um, and the like. And so do what he can. Um, ben Swig's uh, modernization of the hotel really does not take, take hold. And starting in the early 60s, uh, for about 20 years now, uh, we docents refer to this as the ugly years because the, the hotel uh, just goes into a deep depression, if you will. Um, it undergoes a series of owners. The owners do not have the best um, plans for the hotel. It keeps going back to Ben Swig in a lot of instances because he'll hold the mortgage. But there are groups that are trying to use it as a retirement home, a tax shelter, et cetera. Um, in 1969, it is used as a dormitory for UCR for a little while. Um, and from what I understand, that was not the best use of the hotel. A uh, lot of pot parties, et cetera. By the early 70s, uh, apartments are going in. There's a group that buys it to um, put in some like senior apartments and maybe open up the rest of the hotel. Unfortunately, they had some very shady business dealings, went into bankruptcy, and out of that, pretty much by 1976, the city of Riverside now owns the hotel. By this time, a number of people have banded together and said, the Mission Inn is the treasure, we need to save it, and this is what's going to bring Riverside's downtown out of the doldrums. The problem, of course, is that the, the Mission Inn had not posted anything near a profit for years. And we have a competing mindset that says maybe what we need to do is get rid of this white elephant uh, and knock it down and maybe find a better use for this uh, entire city block then. The city comes uh, in and says, well, if, um, if nothing else can be done with it, we'll take it over and see what we can do. And they run it under the auspices of the Mission Inn Foundation for about uh, eight years. But by the mid 80s now, it was very obvious that something was gonna have to be done. Uh, somebody's gonna have to, uh, you know, fish or cut bait. We're gonna have to either go in and quit band-aiding this place, go in with a proper renovation of this place to um, fix it up. And these are some shots that I took of the hotel right before it closed in June of 1985. Um, it going through it, all I remember is thinking is this place is really a dump and it had, it had really fallen into disrepair. Um, people who lived there told us of the mushrooms glow, growing in the carpet. Um, and you just knew that Monday morning you would not have any water because engineering would turn the water off to go around and fix all the leaks that had sprung up throughout the week instead of addressing each one of them um, as they popped up. So the city opts to sell it here in 1985 with a proviso that it be restored. And this, um, this comes in 1985 when it closes down in, in June of that year. And um, 1985, they begin the renovation of it. They go through it. Um, and by 1988, it's about to reopen when the Carly group that has it uh, goes under. It goes to Chemical Bank. Chemical Bank is their main creditor. They hang on to it for a while. They kind of finish up the renovation, um, but it takes them a few years. And during that time, during this renovation, it is taken down to the studs, as you can see here, to redo. Um, lots of scaffolding, lots of cleaning, lots of what do we have here. The spires up top here were recast in, in lighter concrete so they wouldn't fall on people because the bolts had rotted out. So they were basically just standing there on those forms. Portions of the foundation were just completely gone. So they would have to re-pour it here. Um, if you know the mission in, the front door is just right over here then. So anyways, um, in 1992, this gentleman here, Mr. Dwayne Roberts comes in and opts to purchase it. And he does, he open, has a soft opening in December 
of that year. And by May, when this picture was taken, basically the entire hotel is reopened uh, as the uh, Mission Inn, and later to become the Mission Inn Hotel and Spa, as it's known today. There is our uh, ribbon cutting, as you will. And he has run it now for nearly 30 years, despite the fact that several people in town gave him maybe a year or so. He is now inching towards the 30 year mark uh, then. So anyways, it has been reopened under the current renovation and it has uh, gained in popularity. It's gotten a number of absolutely fantastic reviews, et cetera. And this is the lobby today. I just took this uh, just a few days ago uh, then. So the early um, Orange County historian once said, uh, Terry Stevenson, once said, I heard Frank Miller of the Mission Inn once say that if you built an adobe shrine beside the road, the public would soon have stories built about it, enough of them to make the shrine famous. And so that's exactly what happened uh, there. So whew, that's in a nutshell, the entire history of the Mission Inn uh, there as we take it from point A when it gets started in 1874 to today. So. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and see if Christine's still awake and uh, see if we have any questions. What a fabulous presentation. Thank you so, so much, Steve. Um, what a history um, that this Mission Inn had and the family to the next generations. It was a wonderful history and a wonderful presentation. Um, well, everybody is saying that this thank is an you. amazing presentation. And we thank you very, very much for doing that for us. So are there any questions from anyone? Because I don't see how you possibly, um, as Steve said, asked whether I was still awake. How could you possibly <laughs> think through this? I mean, your photos and your history was absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, to I'm see glad all you enjoyed that, it. All, all those details. And you're so glad that it's still <laughs> there and it's no. been run with the same manager more than 30 years. So yes. tell us about all the Christmas holidays. Um, actually, the, the Christmas lights, which is known as the Festival of Lights, was started by Dwayne Roberts mm. in 1993. Uh, he, he opened it in 92, so it started in 93. Uh, it was just a way to have a citywide kind of celebration. And it has grown pretty much year after year, obviously not during the mm -hmm. pandemic mm -hmm. uh, there. But if you come down for the uh, switch on ceremony the day after Thanksgiving, we've some estimates are upwards of 50 or 60,000 people are downtown um, there. Oh. So, yeah, it's quite a bit. Uh, somebody asked, can you tell us about some of the presidents who have visited? Oh, sure. Um, we have a wall with the portraits of the presidents who have been here at the hotel. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was the first one. Uh, to come to the mission in uh, there. And that's why we have the presidential suite because that's where he stayed uh, then. He also transplanted one of the two parent naval orange trees in the courtyard of the hotel uh, for us. But he was on a whirlwind trip throughout the West and uh, came here to Riverside and stayed at the mission in. Um, gosh, we've had Herbert Hoover come twice, not as president before and after, uh, JFK, we discovered a few, a number of years ago, was here as a student at the World Affairs Committee meeting in 1940. Um, let's see, I mentioned Hoover. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, Richard Nixon was by far our most uh, frequent <clears throat> visitor because he had an aunt who lived here in Riverside. So he would visit quite often and come in. And if you look at our wall of presidents, his is on the one far side over there because there's actually plaque dedicated to him because he was married at the hotel uh, then. Our latest one is George W. Bush came here a couple of times, uh, once as president, and he dedicated another suite uh, too called the Keeper of the Inn Suite, which is nowadays the largest of the suites in the hotel. William Howard Taft was here. Um, hmm. and yeah, a number of, of presidents came here. So Tom Lenzo has a question. Yes, uh -huh. a, fr a friend and I lived there in the apartments in 74 through 1976. And yes, plumbing was one of the problems. 
ants, mechanical, it was a, but it was a fascinating place to live in. Question is, do you have any apartments now? Or is no. it all a hotel? It, it is strictly a hotel. Um, and that, that was an early decision uh, made. There are no uh, apartments there, just strictly a hotel. I took a lot of photographs while I was there. Is there a place I could donate them? Absolutely. Uh, the Mission Inn Museum would uh, love to have them. Um, and uh, if you want to call them, write me. I, I put my, my I got your email, email out. Yeah. Uh, then I can get you in touch with the people who uh, would uh, need to know. Great. This was some great memories. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. So you have an, a question. Young Frank sounds like he was doing very well even before he bought the hotel from his father. How did he get such a good start? Was there family member money or was he just ambitious? Um, well, he was quite ambitious and he was not educated. His parents were both college educated. He hated school. He did not like uh, that kind of environment, but he had a good business sense. And so early on, a, uh, one of the very first guests at the hotel was a man named Albert White. Um, and if you know White Park in Riverside, that's named for him. And he kind of saw this enthusiasm and business sense. So he got him started, um, got him started with buying a land to plant an orange grove, then the grocery store and the like. He always had the business sense that his father, unfortunately, didn't. His father lost a lot of money in business ventures. He was the better surveyor engineer and should have stuck to that. But um, no, when Miller, um, Miller plowed basically everything he had back into the hotel there. So he was never really a cash rich individual. Now he ran with that crowd. Like I said, he knew Henry Huntington and he knew all these uh, people, but um, he was always plowing everything back into the hotel. I never got into his whole collecting mentality that you know puts all the artifacts in the hotel and the like too, but he's always buying stuff and selling stuff in and around the hotel in there. Okay, fascinating. So uh, that picture of Henry Huntington, was, I think that was a picture of the, uh, our main central library. Am I correct? There with the, with the fountain or is that, was that actually at the Mission Inn? That the picture that you had of Henry Huntington? I thought Henry Huntington was just by himself. No, there was, well, he was, but there was the background, the background, the building behind him with the fountain. There was- I, I think you're talking about Myron Hunt. Oh, I'm, uh, the, you're the, absolutely the picture. Right. The yes, picture yes, of uh, yes. Henry Huntington is just him. Yes, right. um, I don't. I, I, I don't actually a, know where that is. You don't. I think it's actually at Pasadena Central Library. Oh, okay. I, it's my. That's good Hunt. to know. That is the facade of our central library and the fountain. I'm sorry. It was. It is Myron, not Hun Henry Huntington. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I think that's what it is. And of course, you know, unfortunately, right now our building is closed for retrofit, um, seismic retrofit, and. Um, renovation and it won't be open for five or six years but okay. we have um, nine other branches so um so do um let's see somebody else has asked was it a railroad hotel or as the large hotel property in pasadena no it was not um it was a hotel first and foremost riverside unlike most cities in southern california started first and then the railroad came to it we did not start on the railroad and it actually took us a little while to get the railroad once we did we had three um so we were overpopulated with them but no this was not a railroad hotel it was strictly something that a civil engineer and his family started to have something to do uh because all the all the kids the youngest of the children was either 12 or 13 so they were all in their teens so all of them could help it wasn't like all the kids were two they could all work at it and work at it dead then. Okay. Um, any the regrets or misgiving from Miller's children having passed up taking ownership of the hotel? Um, it does not sound like it. I am in contact with the only, the, you had those three grandchildren. The only one of them to have children was Helen. And of that, she had twin boys and a girl the twin boys are both gone. I'm in contact with the uh, girl. Um, she doesn't really even know very much about it, which is why she actually contacted me. Um, 
because her mother had children late in life. And as she said, by the time I got out of my teens and twenties and actually started caring about it, mom was on the way down um, there. So she's, she's learning about it as much as she can, but um, it doesn't sound like there were any misgivings on her end uh, and certainly not by the grandchildren there. Because remember, they sold it in the 50s. They all were pretty much gone by the late 70s, early 80s. And the hotel was still very much in those, what I call the ugly years then. So I bet their thought would have been, we dodged that bullet um, there. None of them saw any of the renovation and the opening uh, of it, the grandchildren. Okay, then you have another question. Did it suffer earthquake damage? No. Um, when we had the, um, uh, which was the earthquake in 94? The, um, well, whatever the earthquake in 94 was. Northridge, thank you. The Northridge earthquake, we noticed one of the chimneys had a crack in it, slight crack. That was about it. We're not on any faults here um, in Riverside. We're between them. So not that that helps, but it's better than being on a fault, certainly. Um, also, when did the hotel racially desegregate? Um, to be honest with you, during the Miller years. Um, another thing I, I couldn't get into was some of the famous faces that you've seen here. Miller very much loved all cultures of the world and he hired all of them. And he also encouraged them to speak their own native languages. So if you'd been here in the 1900s or teens or twenties, you probably would have seen Japanese, Filipino, uh, Mexican workers all speaking their own languages because Miller was very much a pacifist and thought about bringing the cultures of the world together. When Booker T. Washington uh, came and visited in 1914, Miller took him on a trip up Mount Rubidoux, had him give a speech in the music room, and then uh, he stayed there and dined in the dining room. Uh, Mr. Washington was well aware of the, situ of the times, and he said, no, I'll take my dinner up, up in my room, and Miller said, absolutely not, you will dine with me. And so if you ask, when did we desegregate? you're probably looking at when it was built then or very soon afterwards then is the property on the national registry of it is a city a city state and national register historic landmark and that goes all the way back i think the uh, state landmark is in the early 60s the national register is 1977 um, and the like it's one of the earliest ones uh certainly in riverside so well thank you very very much steve for a fabulous presentation um so if you haven't been to the mission inn i recommend that you go and it's wonderful that tom has pictures that he's going to send and i think someone has agreed with me that it is myron hunt standing in the courtyard at the Pasadena Central Library with the elaborate facade and the fountain. So you can add the fact that um, Pasadena <laughs> Central Library is now um, in this and you discovered that at um, this program with the Pasadena Central Library. There you go. There you go. So what a coincidence. <laughs> so thank you so, so much for a wonderful program. Um, Please go out and visit the Mission Inn. And Ken, if we want to visit with you, do we find you some days in the Mission Inn? You're, give, you're a docent? Um, I, I do. Um, and then I'm there every Tuesday night doing the docent training. Uh, period, uh, and of course, I do tours periodically. Uh, also, I did put my email address. If you have questions, you're more than welcome to email me with uh, those. So, And people can take a docent tour. Of Absolutely. Every day. Um, they are every day. I highly suggest you call ahead and get reservations um, just because uh, sometimes a tour can look to be free and then we get a bunch of walk-ins or what have you. So especially when you're going to drive an hour or so to get here, I would very much call ahead and reserve time. Great. Well, thank you so much for spending an afternoon with us. It was a fabulous presentation. Thank you. Glad to thank do it. Thank you. Great. 
we have other programs um, uh, for this special program for One City, One Story 2022, featuring the book Susan Strait in the Country of Women. And of course, you can check the book out from the Pasadena Public Library, or you can purchase a copy at Romans. We did have copies that we were giving free to the community. Um, unfortunately, they are all um, spoken for. And yes, the presentation will be uploaded to the Pasadena Library YouTube. It'll take us about six days to get that done. Um, the next programs that we have is a pictorial presentation of the California Citrus Crate Labels, the River Riverside Citrus Story as well. So please go to our website, Pasadena Public Library, and you can see the programs in our off the shelf. So thank you so much for joining us today and a big thank you to Steve Leck. Good night.